Welcome, Feel Good Fathers. Today, we're talking about, uh, interesting enough, starting a business, coaching, all the hidden skills you need to develop in order to be a successful business owner, especially as you're leaving the world of a W-2 or corporate employee into a business owner. And then number two, balance. What happens when your family's out of balance, what you can do, how you can lean in. And today I'm joined by Thomas Fanner of The Leadership Dad. He has a fantastic story and I'm really excited for you to get into it. But first, if you want to know more, uh, we'll, we'll say this uh, as well at the end. It's dadswholead.com so you can find more information. Thomas, I'm super excited you're here. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jay. Excited to be here. Excellent. Let's let's get into uh, the real interesting stuff. First, uh, I would love to talk about the balance, the story, what happened, and then we'll get into like what you figured out and how uh, other fathers our listener, feel good father can, can apply that. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's hard to tell my story without starting out that I became a dad at 18, um, for my son, Charles. And it was very clear early on that his mom and I were not a match to be together. Uh, and so we've took our lives in our own separate ways, continuing to raise Charles. And, um, when he was in, seventh grade we we're both living in eugene oregon and this was right in the depths of covid uh he, we were just starting to get back to hybrid in-person school at the time and she one day i got a text message like i'm moving two and a half hours away mm -hmm. okay so it left this void of like what's going to happen with charles as it turned out, he wanted to stay with me. So he stayed with me um, and lived with me for nine months full, and my wife full time. Uh, at the time, my daughter Maddie was two. Um, and things were going pretty well. We had, uh, you know, obviously ups and downs at any, any teenager, eighth grader. Sure. Uh, but I coached his flag football team and uh, he was working. He was. Uh, passing all his classes in school and then we had a little icy patch in uh, december and january of his eighth grade year and i thought i didn't realize it was bad as it was um and i remember saying goodbye to him one day uh at the start of the school day and he was riding his bike to school and i drove to work where i was working as a uh, middle and high school, uh, middle school PE teacher at a different middle school than he was, he was going to. And that night after I got done coaching wrestling, I couldn't get a hold of him. Didn't know where he was. And I was like, well, either he's actually in trouble or he's ignoring me. And mm. he's, he's basically like something didn't feel right. And finally I got a call. And the call was, Dad, I'm done with you. I'm tired of being controlled. I'm moving in with Mom. So this was all after we had started in, in motion the legal process for him to stay in Eugene and live with me full time, um, like permanently, because uh, there were some issues with Mom trying to govern what's happening at school, but she's not in town or have, you know, like not on boot. She, her boots weren't on the ground dealing with Charles. And so it was becoming an issue um, cause she still had officially had full custody of him though. Um, I was the one that was, that, that had him. Um, if you're a dad and you're not familiar with custody, um, custody just means you make school uh, non-emergency medical and religious decisions. Um, mm. and so I had 50, 50 time before she left, but she had custody. And so it, it made the waters more murky. Um, so Charles picked up and left and I sat there in his bedroom and I was like, all right, well, he's not here. I'm not able to change Charles because he wouldn't really even talk to me unless he needed something very specific from me, like information. Um, and I, the only one to change is me. I need to change how I'm leading, how I'm guiding. And, you know, I, I wasn't coming from the space of ground zero. I was not sure. a dad that wasn't involved in his life. 
if anything, he probably felt like I was too involved. So I had to figure out how I could stop parenting him and start leading him in this next season of his life where he would be, you know, the main character in his own story and making his own decisions and his own mistakes. I, I think it's super common and I'm not speaking to this from the perspective of being a boy dad, because I'm a girl dad, right? I have yeah. two girls. That's the world. But as a son, I can absolutely remember being roughly that age and being like, F off parents. <laughs> like I want to, I'm starting to figure this out, starting to do my own thing. I, I believe it was right near the end of seventh grade. Now I was in Toronto at the time. That's when I noticed I was spending way less time at home just in general is way outside more way with my buddies more doing all those other kind of kind of activities. And so I love that. Uh, and I can see, I, uh, sorry, I love the example and I yeah. can see where he was coming from and what, what his statement yes. was, was saying. And I know that feel good fathers will understand that too. Yes. There are two things that I wanted to follow up on for this story. The first was what you kind of touched on a little bit, but what the heck did he mean by controlling? Like, were there any, mm. Is there anything going on here? Any any further details that we can add yeah. on, on here? So I, as a dad, and especially if you're a man listening to this, we grow as men, we understand, we start to learn life and like, okay, this is what it takes to be successful. Working out in the morning, mm. getting good sleep, getting good nutrition, treating people right. All of these things that we've learned and know we want to pass on to our kids. Sometimes they're not ready to receive it though. And so, and that's what I had learned. So I was like, Hey, all right, well, Charles, I, he had a cell phone and I would, I had regulations on a cell phone. Like he could use it with an app so many hours a day, he could access his phone. Um, and that was always a point of contention when he was with his friends and his phone would run out of minutes for the day. Oh, your dad's controlling and, um, uh, we should try to hack the passwords and see what it is. And it became when that phone shut down that it wasn't the app that was blocking him or the agreement that he and I made, like, this is a good amount of time for a day, but it was me restricting him mm. when it was, Hey, Charles, after school, you know, let's make sure before you go out that you get your assignments done um, before you go hang out with friends this weekend and you're caught up in your classes. It wasn't me. It wasn't him that was feeling like, oh, I've got to get through this level to be able to unlock. And, and I'm the limiting factor. Charles is the limiting factor. It was dad is holding me back. Another thing that I did was I would track his sleep. So I, he had a Fitbit and I was just like, Hey, you know, let's have you, you wear your Fitbit to bed and see, I just want to, you know, see what your sleep is like, what time you're going to bed, what time you're getting up. And so, which as a dad at the time, I'm like, this is important data. One, is he getting enough sleep? Uh, is that where the issue is? Like if he was having trouble in school. So it was all from the space of love and wanting him to grow. But that container that I boxed him around created a, a pressure that caused him to want to get the hell out. I, and I can, like, I can totally see, I can totally see that. Cause I know one, one part that's super important for, uh, well, for everybody, right. Is just, especially for kids at, at that age is agency. They want to have a little bit more control of their life. I remember being that age and it was, um, pager. <laughs> so just nice. kind of aging myself a little bit. So it was nice. earning. Uh, so the first thing was earning the, the right to the pager by first was checking in at night, usually by payphone or house phone, and then also being home at curfew. So yeah. this was like, I'm, I'm thinking like, as I'm, Eighth grade didn't have a pager, didn't get it until high school, but it was, I think it was my freshman year. I had spent a good six months making sure I was home at night when I need to be home, making sure my homework was done, getting, you know, getting grades, doing all that kind of stuff. I mean, I played football, I played, I did drama, I did, I did everything. Yeah. So all these different activities 
and earning that right uh, with the the pager um, would 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 allow me to figure would allow them to contact me when they needed to because then it that that pager gave me more freedom right yes. it was the more of the rope so then I can go and do anything and then by the time I was sixteen so by the time my junior year in high school. I know things have changed today, just kind of aging that a little bit, but for our older dads here, we get that, uh, you know, that's when we had full licenses was at 16. So when I had a car and I could go and do my own thing, that pager was super critical. And that would be, you know, after football games on Thursday, Friday night, going out and we used to go to a place called the Rams Horn 24 hour diner. And we would just have, you know, oddly enough, weird coffee and food and it was, it was a good time. Anyways, different, different kind of life, but I can totally, yeah. I can see where he's coming from. So the, so the other piece I, and I think this is really, I think the crux of what you're talking about is what is this difference between parenting and leading? Yeah. Parenting is very direct and we have to do this a lot with the younger kids and it, and it, think of it as a, like a slope where I guess it would be like this, like the amount that you have to parent when they're zero is 100%. You're having to do everything for them. They're not making any of their decisions. Everything is like, I need you to do this or I'm doing this for you. And as they get older, there's less and less direct. I need you to get on your shoe, get your put on these shoes now and we're leaving. And there's more and more decisions that they're making until finally they're on their own and they're 18 and they're out of the house and they're doing all their own decision making. Um, so leading is less about telling your kids what to do and more about taking the actions for yourself that you hope and trust in God that by taking these actions and setting this example, they will follow. Love so it. being a person who like wakes up in the morning and exercises being a person that eats healthy food, are your kids going to also um, probably be at friend's house and have soda or chips? Probably yes. But if you're, the culture in your home is we're having dinner, we make healthy food, we put it on the table, we eat it, we drink water with dinner. Now the culture within the, in the environment that you're creating is doing the lesson as opposed to you saying, you're not going to sneak candy bars. You're not allowed to eat chips. You're not allowed to stay up past a certain time. Now you're putting them in a box as opposed to letting them expand and explore their choices for themselves. Um, and that's as I moved back here to with Charles, uh, basically fast forward the story. Um, we went to, through a court battle. Uh, I showed that Charles was being successful when he was uh, here, when he was with me and that he was like, frankly, Jake, he was on a really bad path. He was not attending school. He was getting F's in all his classes. And I knew that if I wasn't able to get back in his life, he would likely be a high school dropout by Christmas right. of his freshman year. Um, right. So I moved, left my teaching job, moved out here to central Oregon to be with Charles um, to give him that guidance. And, um, that was kind of the next phase in, in the journey. I think, I think this is really, th this is the key part of the story. I think like there's, there's all these different elements that kind of lead to it. But when we're talking about telling a story, right, this is the climax. This is, this is the most important moment and, uh, feel good fathers pay attention, right? Uh, a lot of us don't ever have to make this decision. A lot of us don't ever have to decide to leave a job, to leave security, to leave whatever it is that we're doing, leave a passion, whatever, to uh, make sure that the family unit is healthy. And what Thomas just said was a really great example of saying, okay, well, I can prioritize myself, which is what, um, and this is so interesting, Right. That's what the world is going to tell you. You have to self actualize yourself that you have to maximize your income. You have to maximize your career. You have to, you have to be okay for the family to be okay. And, um, it's I, personally, and I'd love to hear Tom and Thomas, I'd love to hear your, your perspective on this. I, I think it's kind of malarkey because I think that especially for fathers and mothers, that if the family unit isn't correct, if it's not operating well, it's going to impact every other area of your life. 
Yes. Yes. So it's very true. And it's easy to leave si- lose sight of that. And uh, I am drawing a blank. I believe it's in Mark. Um, Jesus says that uh, a house divided will not a, a house divided will not stand and a kingdom divided will not stand yep. um, it's a little more detailed than that but that's basically the the presence of if you're fighting amongst yourselves uh, you're not going to last and i it takes sometimes for me it took seeing my son walk out of my life and have the house divided and there were a lot of people that were saying well don't risk your two daughters and your wife to go chase Charles. Like he's his own, like, no, like, he's a part of the family. I'm going to be committed to him until he's no longer a kid. Uh, I'm going to do everything I can. And even after he's an adult, I'll still be there in a guide in a different way. Um, but it's taking ownership over the results. And that's something that can be really hard for dads. And that's when I'm, um, analyzing if I'm going to work with a uh, prospect or not is, or uh, someone who's, who's looking to get some guidance from me. Um, are they willing to take ownership of when things don't go right in your home? You're number one, the leader of the home. Are you willing to own your side of it to look at what you can change and stop trying to change your kids and your wife, but try to change your leadership first and what you're doing first uh, and set that example of change and evolution. Love it. Love it. Absolutely love it. And so I think here we get an opportunity now to glimpse into what you had to do and what was sort of the next chapter in your mm-hmm. life. So you left teaching. I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of assume that this is when you began leadership dad. Yes. Yeah. So dad, yeah, I was doing the, the father son retreats. Um, but after I stepped away from teaching, that's when I had just started to do the coaching with dads. Um, and I was like, all right, I can substitute teach or continue on this path that I, I'm on. And it was an easy decision. I didn't want to go back to education, especially as a substitute teacher and have a, a random schedule. Um, Yep. And I was ready for, I, I, and Jay, to be totally honest with you, as I, I reflected and spoke to God in this journey, it was, I, I, and I absolutely loved being a PE teacher. A lot of people are like teaching is such a hard job. Being a middle school PE teacher really wasn't that hard for me. I know a lot of people would like really struggle, but for me, my personality and who I am, it was like, as far as like per dollar per hour, per effort level and the amount of time that I get off, summers, winter breaks, weekends, all that, very easy. Um, but the truth was I felt God had called me to do more than to teach kids how to play dodgeball. And sure. <laughs> that's when it was like, okay, I know I can do this. I know it's it feels like pretty fun and easy, but like that I know that I'm meant to do more. Uh, and not like in a, a selfish way, but just like I want to provide more for the world than what I'm able to do here. And not that teaching PE isn't a really important job for those kids that are in that classroom. It, it really is. Uh, but I want to reach and impact families that are really looking to unlock some things that are blocked. To, to me, it feels... Uh, and we'll get to we'll get to that comment in just a minute. To me, it really feels like a really good evolution of the brand and what you're doing. Yeah. And so it's a, a a very good evolution of you were targeting the individuals, you were targeting um, the kids. And by that's what I mean by the individuals. Yeah. And you're helping them develop in a specific way. And now you're doing the same for the fathers, and that aligns with your actions of leading from the front instead of parenting. Yeah. Love it. Okay. So. What were your big strategies and what were your uh, big challenges as you were starting the leadership bed? The biggest challenge then and now is the mindset that like, who am I to be a leader for dads? Uh, Like, why am I some expert in 
guiding and and so like that self i don't like to use the word self-doubt but um that space of you know i am like uh, guiding especially dads with teenagers who who feel their teenagers pulling away i'm fairly young for having a teenager um you know i i'm 35 my son's 16 and gonna be 17 in a few months uh so there's that doubt of oh are people gonna see me talking about fatherhood i mean i've had people ask me not in a way of spite but like do you have kids like yeah, I have three kids, <laughs> you know? Uh, right, so right. that's, that part's tough. Uh, but like, it's, it's coming through. Um, and the walk with God is a big part of that too. Just like trusting, living by faith, not by fear. Um, that's the same stuff that we worked on over the, on the retreat over this past weekend. Um, and then learning all the skills of the business. Like, yes, I have to be able to coach, get on the phone and, and help a dad that's going through a, a struggle. And... I've got to be able to be visible for that person. I'm not naturally, my son Charles is very good at getting attention and attracting eyeballs. Uh, and I'm great at listening and understanding mm-hmm. people. So finding ways to be visible and out there in a way that's authentic um, is the other challenging part. Get people to know me and then everything going through with a business, like you've got to be able to, if you want to be able to serve people, you've got to be able to get them across the finish line and have them commit, um, you know, not just their time to a program, but financially to a program so that, that it, it can provide for me and to be a pro, you know, to have this as my career, it, it's a lot different than somebody who's just doing it to help people out. So it feels this, this whole strategy of working with strangers feels definitely like a, a really great skill that you can bring into your home. Uh, a lot of these oh, yeah. ideas of enrollment, right? They're the same things that you're doing with your kids. You're enrolling them into the vision for themselves. You're enrolling them into the vision for the house. You know, we talk about family values, all that kind of yes. jazz. So what are your thoughts here? As far as getting, uh, whether it's my wife, daughter, son committed to a program and, and moving forward with it. You know, when I'm guiding my family, I'm really looking to guide them to commit to what's in their own heart. Um, and we do have family values and I like to talk about like, Hey, what's, what's important to you. And then I'm ultimately kind of the guide pushing it through and doing chore lists. Like, Hey, what's, what are the things that need to happen and getting that through, um, communicating with everybody listening is huge. Um, but I'd say overall it's whether I'm working with a client or I'm working with my four-year-old daughter or 70, 16 year old son, what is it? Where are you right now? Where do you want to be? What does it take to get there? Okay. Mm -hmm. And are you committed to that path and holding them accountable to what they've said they're going to do. And that's the, if I were to ask my son, if I were to get an honest answer from my son, the the toughest part about being in our house is not doing what somebody else says for you to do. Now it's doing what you've said you're going to do and following Mm -hmm. through with that. I think that's a, I mean, integrity and commitment. That's the, even for my 12 year old daughter, right? That's something that, that we do, we struggle with, uh, you know, our, the motto here that we've developed is like, if you make a mess, you clean it up. Yes. Just kind of a, the, to kind of build the small wins of like, okay, great. So your room's a mess. So I'll hang out with you. We'll put some music on and you got to clean it up <laughs> or you got to pick up your dishes. Or you got to do yes. these kind of things like the, the gradual scaffolding, right. Of just general responsibility. That's yes. super good. So that, that sounds really great. What are the big challenges in getting, uh, I mean, let's just stick with teenage boys, right? What are the big challenges in getting teenage boys to commit? Today is so many distractions. That's really it. Like that's what that my dad's generation, my dad was born in 1944. And when he was 12 years old, 
15 years old, there are not as many distractions. So he had the opportunity to become bored. And mm. when young men become bored, they become curious and they take action. So you can see curious men taking action who are bored, really cool things start to happen. Sadly, curious men taking action is not something that our culture right now values. So um, that's really tough to see, not just Charles, but the young men and that when they come to the retreats and work with, if they're distracted by their phone and social media and what other people think so much more than you and I were, uh, it distracts them from listening to their heart and it distracts them from getting to the space of exploring. Hmm. I'm curious, I'm kind of bored. Like what would happen if we were to set this on fire or, uh, go on a bike ride or like whatever, like just, just this exploration is not happening at the same degree that it was in past generations. And there is a lot of growth and independence and lessons that young men have learned in the past of what they're capable of through that free play and, and growth and expansion that now the video games and the cell phones are, are uh, robbing their childhood. Yeah, that's the, I think it's a concept of, uh, I know it's managed risk, right? Like um, climbing a tree is risky in that, yeah, you could fall out of the tree and maybe, you know, twist your ankle or break a leg or ruin your shoulder or something like that. Yes. And it's only when it gets really, really high that it's life-threatening, but it, it, it's kind of this childhood kind of i think of a little bit of a rite of passage go 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 climb that tree uh, go as high as you feel because i i remember being in some really tall trees and on a windy day and being like i'm not hanging out in this tree that's swinging back and forth <laughs> right <laughs> getting real high i'm yeah. gonna go down and low and just kind of figuring out what's what's my risk tolerance you know and i think and i i agree with you on that i think uh, the other side too, that's really critical and important. Um, and then we're starting to see this now with a lot of the Gen Zers and a lot of the, the younger kids growing up that have had the internet, that have had phones and computers and games stuff like that their entire life, that there's just that social connection and ability to have a conversation that's just not working. Uh, just those general social skills. And then also the other piece, which I think is the worst, which is being able to handle any sort of pressure or adversity. Mm. If your entire life you can enter and exit a conversation at your desire, how the heck are you going to sit down in front of your boss and explain how you underperformed? Yeah, you know how the heck how that how's that going to happen? You know because the um, teachers aren't really sitting there um, helping you go from a C to an A, right? Right, and the stakes are really are kind of low in school. Yeah, you know, and the, the difference it. maybe uh, you know you have some incentive with your family. Or like personal pride in I am most going into grades, most kids from being in school, they identify themselves as a certain level of student. Mm. Oh, I'm an A student. I get A's. I'll do what it takes to get to that level. I'm a B student. I'll get B's. I'll show up. I'll like, you know, I'm a D student. Like, I don't care. Like it D's doesn't like they, they find a spot where they identify and then their level and effort adjusts to hit that mark. Hmm. Interesting. Do you see, um, do you see many students or kids? Did you see many students or kids going up or down? No, I mean, there, it happens. Yeah. There's a kid who like really struggles at the beginning of the trimester or sixth grade and then, you know, starts to get better and better grades. Um, it's not always consistent, but like the, the kids who are getting A's and B's in sixth grade are going to get A's and B's in eighth grade. Like the, the biggest thing that would shift that is work ethic level. Like sometimes if there's a kid that's underskilled, and that was me growing up, mm -hmm. I was very underskilled as a student dropping my pen. Uh, I was underskilled as a student. 
And the less it had to be, you know, when you're in fifth, sixth grade, it's like, how is this kid performing? That was a lot of it because you have so much time. As soon as it was, here's the assignment, go do it. I'm like, oh, okay, well, shoot, I can do it. Like, even if it takes me an extra 20 minutes, if there's an assignment, I'll do it. Uh, and it was just about work ethic. So mm. to answer your question, I guess digging a little deeper in what we opened up with grades is I think grades are a great reflection of someone's work ethic, not so much their intelligence level. Um, Love it. Yeah. Love it. And I think it's really, uh, this is a really indicator, you know, even driving it back, right? Because school to business, right? Work ethic is huge. Uh, and work ethic is um, you can be most super successful business owners. They're not necessarily more intelligent than the average person. They just have a better work ethic yes. and the resiliency to keep going. Yes. And the, the people that I've seen do really well in business are the people that are able to tell themselves to do things. And that's one thing that I feel school does a really poor job of is helping the kids reflect in their own heart of what's the action that you want to take, kind of tying back into, I want to go climb that tree. I want to go start a fire. Um, when we listen to our heart and say, like, I want to go do that, it's a lot different than somebody else giving you an assignment doing an assignment for someone else. Um, so I, I hope to see this next generation and fatherhoods that are listening. Like how can I get my kids to listen to their own heart and the actions that are stirring up inside them? This sounds so much like everything is uh, figure outable plus you have all the information on the internet. And so one of the big things that I, I tell my daughter, you know, she'll have a question and I'll be stumped or, you know, mom will be stumped or something like that. And I'm just like, well, where would we go to figure this out? And just trying to, you know, trying to teach her at this age is like, okay, well, what are the tools that are available in yeah. front of you where you can go dig a little deeper? Cause that was, so it's really funny. I played a lot of games growing up, you know, I ended up becoming a video game developer and I think probably the absolute best skill that I learned was that if I wanted an answer to something that was happening in the games, I just went and I go, I went and I found the answer. This was the golden age of the, or the golden age, What is the bronze age, Advent. the beginning, yeah. the beginning, the, the beginning yeah. of the internet, right. In the, in the late nineties, the two thousands. And so, um, we just go look stuff up, just go, just open up. I mean, AOL, Sierra online, yeah. all those different places, just kind of hang it, hang in there. And then uh, that just transferred into the professional world where it's like, oh, I need to go figure out how to do something. Thank you, YouTube. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, blogs. Uh, I got my position in video games because I ended up following David Perry. He had a game design challenge. It was like this game review analysis challenge to, to think critically about games. I completed that. And then, um, and then I learned a heck of a lot of just bloggers and stuff like that. Blogging was more big uh, for YouTube at the time, but I was figuring it out. Yeah. And so I think that's the, um, I think the core thing that I would say critically would be that rather than technology being a time waster, right? Rather than like scrolling through shorts and scrolling through Instagram or TikTok, or whatever, and being entertained and engaged, why not treat these these pieces of technology as a tool to help you do the next thing, which is yeah. what they are. Yeah. yeah. It just comes down to the question who's using who you know, yeah. are you using technology or is it using you? Yeah. Love right. it. Love right. it. Yeah. So the, the other big things we were talking about a little bit, you said earlier with your son, he's really great at getting in front of people, attracting oh, attention. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a skill you had to learn off air. We were talking about branding and coaching. So yeah, as a, as a brander, you know, I work with coaches, speakers, authors, uh, the whole, the whole deal workshop focus and trainers, uh, helping them build their brand. So this is something I'm super familiar with. And so, um, I would love to hear your take as one of those folks, as a, as a person who's building a brand, uh, about this whole branding copywriting space. Oh yeah. Great question. Uh, number one, you got to see it as a skill set and know that it's going to take time to learn. Like mm -hmm. you didn't learn to read or speak a language in four weeks. 
and you're not going to learn to close or write a, a web page in a few weeks. You're going to make some and it's going to be bad. It's going to be really bad. And the next one's going to be a, a little less worse. And you're going to keep making things over and over and seeing what's working. And it's, there's so much patience and patience isn't about whether you're making sales or not. It's patience with yourself to de continue to develop the skills. Um, if you know, like if someone is the, a high level copywriter, I mean, someone who is working for um, Apple, I don't know. I'm just bringing pull. That's like one of the bigger brands that I can think of. They're like, like Apple's chief copywriter. They could see probably what you or I are going through in the problem and figure out a solution and a funnel, whether that's Facebook. Like there's so many different routes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You could write a book, you can have Facebook ads, you can have a Facebook group, you could have a, a group on Telegram, you can do Instagram, you can do YouTube, LinkedIn. Can all of those work? Yes. And so with the information age where we get tied up is, let me find the right one. And they mm -hmm. all can work, but it's like, which one are you going to become good at? Which platform are you going to become good at? And that skill set, not just of getting the people attracted, that's great, but also then creating an offer that people like, talking to people. And if you're going to sell for something that's going to be more than a few hundred bucks, you better be able to sell it over the phone talking to them uh, and close them over the phone. Um, and that's, and I say close, I mean, it's really about helping them identify if it's the right solution for them, for them to make the decision for themselves. But um, yeah, it, it's important. It's, it's a, it is a term. It is a business term. Yeah. <laughs> even, even folks that are doing sales-based stuff uh, and, and service-based service based sales, right? Yeah. That's, that's, we still use that term. Uh, that I, I'd love to kind of wrap this around because if there's feel-good fathers that aren't, that don't under, that, that haven't wrapped around their, their head around this, I think one of the best things about being a business owner in marketing is that you have much better understanding of the efficacy of what you're doing based on the numbers that you're measuring. And so typically as a W2, the numbers that you're seeing are going to be your annual review or in your month to month or something like that. And typically you need to move into a much more self-guided position. That's typically a sales position in order to understand your inputs and outputs. Yes. And so all marketing, is just, and I loved it. You, you've said all the terms, right? It's all how many eyeballs and how many conversions or how many people have done the thing that you've asked yes. them to do, right? That's what it is. And so if you yes. just measure that across the board, the great thing is, is that it kind of grades you and it doesn't grade you in an A through a D. It grades you in um, opportunities. Am I getting booked calls? Am I getting more opportunities to put my product or service in front of people? Am I attracting the right client? And um, those are some pretty critical skills. And yeah. having a good strategy in place is, is really important for that. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so are there, when it comes to balancing, like when it comes to balancing sort of the, the business owner, the new startup world, this life with, with family life, what are any closing uh, comments or thoughts on, on, on that? For me, my son asked us the other day, Hey dad, why don't you just, we're driving out to jujitsu or Muay Thai. And he's like, why don't you just grind and stay up all night? And like really push and get your business going to the next level. And I told him like, Hey, for me, I'm fine with growing slower and enjoying the process and enjoying make, making sure I'm maintaining my health, my ability to perform and compete my relationship with you kids and that's for me like yeah could i go go up into a closet and alex or mosey it and work 16 hour days and sleep and grind and um just push and i could but i'm not willing to sacrifice that so as i develop who i am even if it's slower 
I want to develop a community and a leadership style that is number one, before I'm worried about how many people are behind me, what is the integrity and how much do I enjoy my life? And it doesn't matter if there's only five people who think that that's awesome that want to follow what I do. Um, I want to do it from a space of what I value and not what the marketplace values. Absolutely love it. I think that's some great, some great wisdom there on slow growth. Uh, my CEO and a mentor, mentor of mine uh, tells me, and we had a conversation about this. She told me that um, fast growth creates ego but slow growth creates continued success. So absolutely love that. It's, it's also uh, a parenting rule, right? Your kids yes. don't go from one to 18 in a year. <laughs> it takes them 18 years yes. to do that. Um, uh, Thomas Fanner, everybody. Thank you. Thank y'all. Thanks, Jay.